بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویلکم بیک ٹو یور آن لائن لیکچر سیریز آف ڈبل ای تھری ون فور میئرمنٹس اینڈ انسٹرومنٹیشن دس از دا فرسٹ لیکچر آف ویک ٹین یور لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی ایٹ اینڈ ان دس لیکچر وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ڈسکس دی ڈیجیٹل سگنل کنڈیشنگ دس از دا پارٹ ون آف دس ویڈیو اینڈ وی ول بی اسپیسیفکلی ڈسکسنگ کمپیریٹرس ہسٹیریسز کمپیریٹرس اینڈ پی ڈبلیو ایم دیٹ از ون آف دی اپلیکیشنس آف کمپیریٹرس اینڈ ویل ڈسکس other applications of comparators as well so this is chapter number three of your textbook number two that is written by curtis d johnson so let's first start with uh, what are digital electronics and what are computers and what is digital signal conditioning uh, because uh, in in the modern world in our everyday life uh, computers have taken a major role so everything's like the Uh, automatic door openers in the store, motion sensors, security systems, uh, uh, y- your uh, car fuel injection systems, your uh, refrigerators, washing machines, my ovens, uh, air conditioners, m- mobile phones, everything has a built-in computer and uh, inside that there is a lot of digital signal processing happening. So uh, the, the, these systems, these digital electronic systems, they require data to be presented to them in a digital format. and for that the data has to be digitally conditioned so what do we mean by digital conditioning of data just like we discussed the analog signal conditioning in which the data was uh, converted from one form to another form or from one uh, level to another level uh, same happens in with digital signal conditioning you should realize that there is no greater accuracy in using digital techniques to represent the data in fact the accuracy is usually lost because uh, the resolution of an analog circuit a, an, an analog signal is infinite but in case of a digital system or a digital signal there is some particular uh, resolution or a step size so the accuracy is usually lost but the digital data are much more immune uh, from spurious influences Uh, that would cause subsequent in accuracy such as noise amplifier gain changes power slide drifts and so on for example if you have an analog signal whose value ranges from uh, let's say 0 volts to 100 millivolts and uh, uh, there, there are noise sources in your environment the electromagnetic interference and the magnitude of that noise ranges from 0 to 10 millivolts that is one significant level of noise for for that data but now let's see if you had a digital data and that had the same amount of noise of 10 millivolts present and added to that signal from the surroundings what would happen the digital data is presented in ones and zeros so either you have a zero volt or you have a 5 volt or 12 volt in cmos logic now that 5 volt with a 10 millivolt noise will still be considered as one in your digital electronics or it it would be considered as one by your digital microprocessor or microcontroller or any other digital device and that zero volts with a 10 millivolt noise would still be considered as a zero but in case of analog circuits the information is the actual reading of that voltage so if you had a voltage reading of 20 millivolts and a 10 millivolt noise is added to that your reading effectively changed so th- th- there is a trade off but still uh, we can safely st- uh, state that the digital data is much more immune uh, uh, from the noise and uh, the gain changes and the power supply sp- 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 drifts etc the use of computers in control systems is particularly valuable for a number of other reasons as well the, these are the major ones a computer can control multi variable process control systems non linearities in sensor output can be linearized by computer by solving the non linear equations complicated control equations can be solved quickly and modified as needed networking of control computers allows a large process control complex to operate in a fully integrated fashion so the these are some major advantages of uh, the use of digital digital technology and computers in your control systems and your when industrial control applications so now let's uh, revise the basics of 
digital data the digital data is uh, represented by binary numbers uh, by ones and zeros and uh, we have extensively studied these uh, uh, binary numbers in our uh, previous courses the logic design computer architecture and microprocessor systems and we all know that uh, the whole numbers can be converted from decimal to binary form by using a single simple formula if you have a uh, number uh, for instance if you have uh, uh, let's say let me write it here if you have a number uh, one zero zero one zero uh, you can easily convert it into a digital form uh, by uh, seeing how many bits are there in this digital number so there are 0 1 2 3 4 this is a 5 bit number so n is equal to 4 because this is the bit number 0 and this is the bit number 4 so you can convert it into a digital data by saying uh, 2 raised to power 4 plus 0 into 2 raised to power 3 plus 0 into 2 raised to power uh, 2 plus uh, 1 into 2 raised to power 1 plus 0 into 2 raised to power 0 so that comes out to be uh, 16 plus 0 plus 0 plus 2 and this number is 18 in decimal what additional thing I want to tell here is that uh, how we represent fractional numbers in binary form so that is also a fairly simple formula you just place a point a decimal point here so that's how you represent fractional binary numbers in uh, digital format so there there is an example this is the formula written for this and uh, uh, the base 10 equivalent of 11010 is uh, 0.8125 and then uh, moving on with the revision of basic concepts uh, we can uh, move on to the boolean algebra the De Morgan theorem etc so we are not going into the details of that uh, that, that is just the start of signal conditioning your digital logic design uh, combinational logic circuits are the start of your digital conditioning circuits so that's why I have included one of these examples here uh, you had to implement uh, an expression where your D your output would should be 1 uh, if uh, the, this expression a not b plus a c plus a c bar b uh, is true so this is a combinational logic circuit and you can implement it using uh, these individual logic components logic gates uh, this is a not gate and gate and or gates so uh, uh, th this output would be one when all of these conditions are true at a time uh, if you see carefully uh, we can further uh, simplify this equation because we know that a bar b plus a is equal to a plus b a plus a bar b is equal to a plus b so if we apply this rule here uh, what we can do is we can take this a common from these two and then uh, we have uh, c plus c bar b so we can write it b plus c into a and uh, uh, this a bar b will remain here and uh, then uh, opening it a bar b plus a b plus c and then again take b common from these two and that would become a plus a bar so uh, a plus a bar is equal to one so uh, your, your expression uh, will become uh, b plus a c so you can implement this uh, same expression using uh, very few components that are required and that are that are represented in this particular figure uh, so this th this is the start of your digital signal conditioning circuits in the more advanced uh, systems in the more advanced digital signal conditioning circuits uh, we are going to take analog data and uh, we are going to convert it into digital data and then process it digitally inside a computer and then convert it back to the analog data and for that we are going to study the components like ADC the analog to digital converter and DAC the digital to analog converter and those processors uh, th those can th those can be uh, PLCs or data acquisition systems or uh, your microcontrollers and microprocessors so uh, let's move on for that uh, and uh, let's give you a, an overview of what are PLCs programmable logic controllers so these are special controllers for industry and uh, they are extensively used 
in any industrial design uh, these devices are uh, particularly suited to the solution control problems associated with boolean equations and binary logic problems in general so they can be called a uh, computer based outgrowth of relay sequence controllers uh, what what uh, this line means this these are the outgrowth of relay sequence controllers and uh, if uh, these are actually an outgrowth of uh, relay sequence controllers what is the purpose and what is the need of plcs we have to compare the microcontroller based systems and the plcs for that purpose and there are many things that need to be compared and their architecture their interface and their performance and reliability the required skill level to operate them uh, the the their programming and their applications so first let's come to the architecture i'll i'll compare the plcs with microcontrollers because we have already studied microcontroller systems and microprocessor systems uh, in our previous courses so you will get a better understanding for that in a microprocessor or a microcontroller we have some uh, digital input outputs and some analog input outputs and uh, a cpu a central processing unit where we can implement uh, any expressions any uh, mathematical expressions and perform some control operations and then with those digital and analog inputs and outputs we can connect our further devices and we can connect relays to that and what is the need to connect relays to our microcontrollers because our microcontrollers operate at a very low power and low voltage and uh, low power means that they are operating at a low voltage and a low current uh, their current handling capacity uh, for each pin each digital pin is uh, not enough to even drive uh, a relay independently so we have to put some transistors and to we have to amplify that current to operate a relay and the relay is the interface uh, that will connect your uh, high power uh, supply to your actual load for example if you want to turn on and off a motor a 1 horsepower or a 1 uh, kv motor uh, with your microcontroller you have to do it through a relay your microcontroller cannot drive the motor directly so if you can connect relays with your multiple inputs and outputs that are available in your microcontroller and you can make a system that would be similar to a programmable logic controller but then uh, the second thing comes be because inside a plc there is also a cpu and that is programmed and there are uh, Uh, some solid state or some mechanical relays connected to that that provide an interface so that cpu inside the plc is similar to the cpu that is present inside your microprocessor or a microcontroller so you at at the core architecture level at the computer architecture level they are similar but the difference lies in the interface performance and reliability and the required skill level to operate that and to program that in case of microcontrollers and microprocessors we Uh, usually use lower level languages programming languages like c assembly or uh, uh, even maybe python but uh, we, we do not program it program these controllers through graphical user interfaces or very very higher level languages so uh, in in plcs they are running a real time operating system inside that The, your microcontrollers are not running a, an RTOS or a real-time operating system. They are running a firmware that uh, uh, that uh, executes those commands, your program sequentially, line by line, command by command. But a PLC is uh, programmed with an RTOS, and that RTOS accepts the inputs in real time and performs the function and provides the outputs in real time. so it is really very easy easy to interface devices with plcs as compared to microcontrollers then coming to the performance and reliability a simple microcontroller based uh, system or a, a training board or an educational kit is not a very reliable platform the interface circuit that you have to design for your microprocessor 
uh, that that circuit that is connected with your relays and uh, your power supply unit and uh, all the interfacing circuit that is not very re reliable and that is not designed to uh, keep keeping in mind the industrial requirements but in case of plcs they are actually specifically designed to withstand harsh environments harsh industrial environments so uh, it, it it is just like uh, for for engineers they can ask a question okay we are engineers we can design pretty reliable circuits so still why we need plcs uh, the the simplest answer can be a bit like asking why would someone buy a computer when they can build one their one of their own you can build a computer if you have a cpu you can interface and you can design a motherboard and you can build your own cpu the problem is th 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 there is more than 3 decades uh, even more of the testing and optimization of that motherboard circuit that is powering up your computer so that is specifically built to withstand Uh, uh harsh operating conditions and to deliver reliable output so th th this answers the question that why industrialists do not prefer to design their own microcontroller based systems but rather they prefer to buy programmable logic controllers that are specifically designed and optimized over the time over the decades for that particular purpose otherwise Uh, it would be wrong to state that uh, these two uh, things are completely different a uh, plc is nothing else but an optimized set of uh, uh, circuitry plus some microprocessor inside that is programmed to uh, to perform those uh, specific control based tasks and then finally again the required skill level to operate that and the required programming Uh, that we discussed is that in industry if someone has to operate that uh, uh, that setup that whole industrial process control system he has to first understand the uh, the design of a particular uh, engineer if it is not based on plc and then he or she would be able to operate that but in case of plcs as it is a standard all over the world Uh, the engineers working in one industry can easily switch or or not even the engineers the technicians or the workers that are uh, uh, just operating that system or the the control uh, pro the process control system they can easily switch to different industries or to different parts of the industry because uh, not everything is customized but they are using a standard then uh, coming on to some other computer based interfaces Uh, the, 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 a computer based system generally has uh, these uh, basic components it has a processor some data lines address lines control lines a memory a display and uh, the, these address data and control lines are collectively called a bus so the data lines carry data to and from the processor address lines allow the computer to uh, select external locations for input and output and uh, the control lines carry information and to and from the computer related to operations such as reading writing interrupts and so on so these collections of lines is called a bus for the computer uh, through which it can communicate with multiple devices then uh, we have uh, another important component that is used in digital signal conditioning and that is a tri state buffer and we have uh, uh, extensively discussed this tri state buffer in our uh, previous course uh, the major advantage of the tri state buffers uh, is that they allow multiple signals to share a single digital line in the bus and we used these extensively to design our memory systems in our uh, computer architecture design if you remember so uh, they have a high impedance output state when they are uh, in uh, open condition so only one of them can uh, be uh, can be turned on at a time and uh, the high impedance state is turned to 1 or 0 depending upon the input of that buffer and now we are going to start with uh, the the individual components uh, that that require more details uh, and we'll start with uh, digital comparators 
uh, and we'll see uh, what are the characteristics of comparators and uh, uh, in, in which applications they are used and what are the limitations associated with comparators and how to handle them. Okay, so let's start with comparators. What is a comparator? A comparator is a device similar to an operational amplifier. It looks similar to operational amplifier, but it is uh, fairly different in its operation and its uh, its applications. There are three terminals again. Uh, there is one positive terminal, one negative terminal and one output of comparator. But a comparator is different from, from an operational amplifier in a way that uh, this output can only give either 1 or 0 like 1 is the logic high and 0 is the logic low so it is a digital device an operational amplifier is an analog device because its output and uh, its output can vary uh, uh, between the negative and positive splice any value any analog value between those two uh, 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 those two limits uh, but in case of comparator it is uh, uh, it is a digital device it compares the level of voltages applied at its two inputs and produces a digital output either one or a zero depending on which of the two inputs was greater so if the input applied at the positive positive terminal was greater in magnitude uh, than the uh, voltage applied at the negative terminal the comparator would give a 1 as its output and if it is the other way around the comparator will give a 0 at its output so before mo uh, moving on to the example of comparators let's see whether an op amp can be used as a comparator or not so here is an op amp and here is its positive and negative input and here is its output so this is V positive and this is V negative and an op amp is here in an open loop configuration so there is no feedback connected uh, from the output to any of these two inputs and we know that the gain of an operational amplifier in open loop is very very high it is uh, in in uh, hundreds of thousands so this op amp can be effectively used to compare these two inputs and then produce uh, its its output voltage and that output voltage will be equal to these supply voltages so in case of op amp you being used as a comparator if v positive is greater than v negative the v out would be equal to v plus plus and if V negative is uh, greater than V positive, V out would be equal to V neg neg. So whatever the supply here is, is, is provided here, whatever the value of supply uh, being provided at the uh, as the power source of this operational amplifier will be will travel through this operational amplifier to its output. So why are we using uh, a comparator for that if an op amp can be used as a comparator why there is a need for a separate uh, device and uh, to call it as a comparator so there are multiple reasons for that and uh, those reasons are uh, provided here in in these two two links so the details of why we shouldn't use operational amplifier as a comparator are uh, uh, explained in detail and and uh, have been very well explained on these two links and uh, they have also told that in which cases we can actually use operational amplifier as a comparator so they, uh, it again it depends upon your application requirements few of them uh, uh, I, I will try to just uh, uh, list down here uh, uh, are that a comparator is a device that is specifically designed to handle digital in uh, digital output not digital inputs but digital outputs so 
it has to provide either 1 or a 0 at the output. But in case of op amp, it is designed to amplify the signal. It is pro designed to uh, provide an analog output. So there is an internal stabilization capacitor that is present inside this operational amplifier and that results in the slew, slewing of the output uh, and uh, the, 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 the response that slows down the output and we, we called it slew rate of an operational amplifier and the slew rate is the time taken by an operational amplifier to change to another value from its saturation value. So when it is saturated at uh, here we can see that when it is operated in an open loop the op, the op amp will be operating in saturation mode always. So it would be saturated either at V++ or it would be saturated either at V neg neg. And uh, because it is saturated to leave that stage of saturation that capacitor needs to be charged or discharged. And that will result in this ramp like uh, uh, behavior and that would slow the down the response of our comparator and we know that in digital signals the transmission speeds or the data speeds uh, the data transmission rates are very very high so this slew rate of operational amplifier will result in uh, uh, delays in our data and it will put a frequency limit on the signals that we are trying to compare. But in the cases where this slew rate is not very important and our uh, uh, rate of change of inputs is not very high, then this op amp can be used as a comparator. And again, and then again, there are certain cases where this operational amplifier will act as even a better comparator than a dedicated digital comparator. Uh, for example, a very high-end operational amplifier with the very low offset and very low noise uh, but uh, with the requirement of lower data speeds uh, will be a better comparator for very minute differences between these two uh, inputs that are not generally detected by a digital comparator. So there are pros and cons of both and uh, they are listed in detail and have have been very well explained in these two links so do visit them and do study them and then uh, coming to one example that is related to your comparators is that uh, where we can use comparators in our digital signal conditioning circuit designs uh, this this example will demonstrate that a process control system specifies that the temperature should never exceed 160 degrees if the pressure also exceeds 10 kPa. So if both your temperature and pressure reach a certain defined limits of their own at a time together the alarm system should be activated. And the transfer function of temperature transducer is this and the transfer function of pressure transducer is this. So we will find out that how much voltage will be there uh, 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 will be produced by the temperature transducer when it reaches 160 degrees. So 2.2 milli into 160 is uh, th uh, 363 around uh, th 353. So 0.352 volts for the temperature and then 0.2 volts per kPa and into 10 kPa is 2 volts. So 2 volts here. So we have two comparators. One is comparing the output of our temperature transducer continuously with a fixed voltage 0 0.352 and 0 0.352 corresponds to a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius. And the second comparator is continuously comparing its uh, its input, the, the output of the pressure transducer with 2 volts which corresponds to 10 kPa pressure. So both of the inputs are connected with the positive terminals of the comparators and the uh, reference voltages or the reference signals that define our temperature and pressure limits are connected to the negative terminals of the comparator. 
so as soon as the pressure exceeds this value the output of pressure transducer exceeds two volts this means that the pressure has exceeded the defined 10 kilopascals the output of this comparator will become one and as soon as the temperature rises above 160 degrees centigrade the uh, output of temperature transducer will be more than 0 0.352 volts and the output of this comparator will also be one and then there is an AND gate and this AND gate having both inputs as one will have an output of one that will trigger the alarm system so this is one of the most basic uh, digital signal conditioning circuits that are uh, 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 used in alarm control of industries and then uh, actually this is the same system that is uh, widely used uh, still used in uh, many basic industries to date then there is a type of comparators that is called open collector comparators and here in figure a we can see the uh, internal structure of that comparator so the collector of this comparator is being given as the output while the emitter is internally grounded so if we have a one at the base this transistor will turn on and it will connect the emitter to the collector and it will provide a zero at the output and if we have a zero at the base this transistor will be off the emitter will not be connected to the collector but the collector is also an open circuit so there will be a floating node at this point and we can connect this floating node to any supply of our choice using a pull up resistor as shown here and what are the advantages of that the major advantage there are two major advantages one of them is it is possible to use a different power source for the output so if your output needs 12 volts to operate and your comparator power supply is 0 and 5 volts your comparator would not have been able to supply enough voltage to your load to drive that so you can connect vs is equal to 12 volts here through a pull-up resistor and now this will supply 12 volts through this pull-up resistor to the load and then the second major advantage is that it is possible to or together several comparators outputs by connecting all the open connector outputs together and then using a common pull up resistor and if any one of the comparators output transistor is turned on this transistor is turned on when this transistor is on this emitter is connected to the collector and a ground flows to the output and it becomes zero so the common output will go low so that will act as a as an inverted OR gate and that is exactly what uh, the tri-state buffers do so the floating nodes are high impedance nodes that can be connected together then there are some disadvantages of comparators the, these are the advantages high speeds and uh, uh, to collect multiple comparators together uh, what are the disadvantages the disadvantage is that if this signal voltage has noise or approaches the reference value too slowly the comparator output may jiggle it, 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 it may jiggle back and forth between high and low like here let's say this is the voltage coming from your transducer and this is your reference value your reference value is a fixed value it's a fixed voltage source so it would stay the same it would be a straight line but this is coming from a transducer and see it is a noisy signal and you want that as soon as let's say this is coming from a temperature sensor and this VREF let's say corresponds to 100 degrees Celsius and you want that as soon as the temperature is reaches 100 degrees uh, your fan is turned on but this temperature sensor the transducer of this temperature sensor uh, it, it has some noise so the output is changing like this as shown here 
so at this point at this particular point the temperature reached 100 degrees at this particular time and the fan was turned on but as there was a noise so the transducer value again fell below 100 degrees at this point so as soon as it falls below that value the fan was turned off again here and then again turned on and off and on and off and then on again so it is turned on and off five times and in this short time period maybe within five seconds try turning on and off a fan for five times in five seconds and you may burn it because of the transients and you don't want that so this this is actually the output of the comparator these are the pulses one two three four pulses when you give pulses to your electronic devices they malfunction due to the transients and we don't want that so how to handle this what we want is we want to include some fail safe mechanism in our comparator circuits that would turn on the the fan or any appliance at the required time and then should ignore this noise for some certain time so we can include some time hysteresis or uh, we can once once turned on we can shift our reference or uh, we can shift our uh, uh, effective virtual reference to a value so that now the fan is not turned off until the volt voltage falls below this value so now if this is the red line let me redraw it if my new reference is this first it is on at this point and now as soon as it is on my reference is automatically shifted down so even if there is some noise we know the magnitude of noise and we shift our reference accordingly so it will still be above the reference and there will be no jiggles uh, or no transients in your output and how to do that we can add a dead band or a hysteresis window to the reference level around which the output triggers and it can be achieved by uh, adding a positive feedback to the comparator now how does it work this is the diagram of the hysteresis comparator circuit where this is the v in this is the v ref and now we have added some resistors just like we did in the operational amplifier but they act absolutely in a different way in this uh, comparator circuit so don't confuse them with the uh, gain of an inverting amplifier or a non inverting amplifier but we do add some resistance in the feed feedback and some resistance at the input and we shift the reference by a certain value that is r over rf into v naught so for the lower voltage the reference is different and for the higher voltage the reference is reference so whenever it has to switch from low to high this is the reference and when it has to switch back from high to low the reference would be different and we don't have to adjust it every time so how, how does this work let me derive that all right so let me redraw that uh, comparator circuit here this is our comparator and uh, here is our r this is our r f this is our v in and this is our v ref and this is our v out so the first condition that we have to consider while designing this circuit and placing this uh, this rf and this r in our circuit is that rf should be much much greater than r and all our calculations uh, will be based on this assumption now so now let's start with when your uh, uh, v plus this is your v plus and this v ref is directly your v minus so when your v plus was less than v minus at this point we know that when the positive input is less than the negative input v out would be equal to zero so this means that 
what would be the value of v plus at that point v plus is equal to v in into rf over r plus rf because uh, this is a simple potential divider circuit this is your v out and that is equal to zero and this is your v plus this is your r this is your rf and this is your v in so rf over r plus rf and as we know here that rf is much much greater than r r plus rf is equal to approximately equal to rf and rf over rf is equal to 1 so v plus is approximately equal to v in the first condition and vref is equal to v negative as it is but let's see what happens if this v in keeps increasing v in is now increased to a value that is greater than v ref until v out is zero v plus is equal to v in as we saw that so so this implies that v plus is also greater than v ref and this will mean that v out will become equal to one now and that is not equal to zero so what's going to happen now what would be the value of v plus that we have to find out so as this is a positive feedback here right here we can see that this is this rf is connected to the positive terminal this v plus should increase and that is what we are going to use to our advantage so let's see how much it is increased and how it is used uh, as, as uh, to our advantage so using superposition we can see here that uh, now after the v out is 1 this is your v in this is your r this is your r f and this is your v out and now this is not equal to 0 and here is your v plus so if i use superposition and i assume first v out to be 0 and then v in to be 0 i can calculate v plus very easily so at first let's assume v out is equal to 0 and we already know that this will give us v plus is equal to or approximately equal to v in we already calculated that then let's assume v in is equal to 0 for superposition let me write it here v when v in is equal to 0 this implies that v plus is equal to now see here this is 0 so it would be the voltage ac drop across this r so that would be v out into r over r plus r f and again we can say that r plus r f is approximately equal to r f so uh, we can say that for this condition v plus will be approximately equal to v out into r over r f and so the v plus would be equal to the sum of these two and that would be equal to v in plus v out into r over r f so the voltage that is reaching the positive terminal now is automatically shifted when the v out became non-zero and it was shifted by this value v out into r over r f so this means that now when the input is already the output is already one and to make it back to zero what is the condition the condition is that v ref should be greater than v positive to take this output back to zero and what was v, v, v positive that was v in plus v out into r over r f and if we write it in a different way this means that now v in should be greater than or equal to 
sorry v in should be less than or equal to v ref minus v out of into r over r f this equation is very very important so now it states that the v in was increasing increased 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 and increased to a value where it became more than the v reference and our v out became 1 now when it became 1 v in decreased but now it should not decrease to a level just below rf it should decrease to a level below rf minus this value so, so your your reference that was at this point previously has now shifted to this point as we discussed right now in our lecture slides so you have successfully introduced an intentional dead band or a hysteresis this is the dead band that has been introduced in your uh, circuit and that is a voltage dead band and that voltage dead band results in hysteresis and that would result in uh, control of transients in operation of your uh, op amps uh, com comparator circuits so that is one uh, very powerful example of uh, using feedback positive feedback in comparators to remove the transient behavior of comparators because of any noise present in the inputs so let's go back to the lecture slides and let's finish this with an example so this is uh, uh, th this is the same thing that is being discussed here this v in should be less than equal to v ref minus r over rf into v not and this dead band or hysteresis is given by r over rf into v not so this example further clarifies uh, what is the uh, the significance of uh, hysteresis comparator the problem states that a sensor converts the liquid level in a tank to voltage so now your transducer's output is voltage according to the transfer function of 20 millivolts per centimeter a comparator is supposed to give high whenever the level becomes 50 cm so for 50 cm it should be uh, 15 to 20 1000 milli volts or 1 volts for 50 cm level splashing causes the level to fluctuate by plus minus 3 cm and 3 cm means uh, the the, the uh, range of 3 cm means around 60 milli volts and as it is plus minus 3 i would say the overall magnitude of splashing can be 120 milli volts now develop a hysteresis comparator to protect against the effects of splashing so we have to introduce a dead band of 120 milli volts in this case to protect against splashing see plus minus 60 millivolts so that is a total range of 120 millivolts so we need a dead band of at least 120 millivolts but the author says to be on the safe side we provide a dead band of 150 millivolts for security so thus we have r over rf into 5 volts this 5 volts is important because this would be the v out that is being provided by the comparator so r over rf into 5 should be 150 millivolts and this gives us that r over rf is 0.03 and this uh, uh, verifies our uh, uh, initial rule or initial assumption that rf is much much greater than r so if we make rf 100 kilo ohms and r 3 kilo ohms uh, uh, this uh, and connect it in the feed feedback the Uh, problem of splashing or the jiggling output would be solved so we discussed the advantage of the hysteresis but we didn't talk about the disadvantage of hysteresis and i intentionally didn't talk about the disadvantage of hysteresis because i 
discussed it in our previous lectures when we were actually discussing hysteresis as a property of our instruments just to clarify what will happen due to hysteresis in this particular case is that even if there is no splashing or a little splashing because the uh, it says that the level fluctuates by plus minus 3 cm up to th plus minus 3 cm so if even if the splashing is lower than this in some cases our switching will be delayed our switching will not be exactly at the same level we wanted our system to respond as soon as the level is 50 centimeters the, the the system will respond by turning the system on or off at 50 centimeters uh, but we wanted to do the opposite as soon as the level reaches below 50 centimeters but now there would be an error in that and the system will not operate until your uh, uh, your level reaches below uh, let's let's find out 1000 minus 150 so that is 850 and 850 divided by 20 is around 42.5 so 42.5 centimeters is the new height that will be reached by the water level to turn that system back to its initial state now the system will not return to its initial state until the height of 42.5 centimeter is of the water level is reached so that 7.5 is an centimeter is an error or that is an error of 15 percent in the water level but again that depends on our application because a water tank level uh, uh, does not need to be precisely maintained at a certain level it we, we just have to turn on or turn off our water pump after a certain level is there so that wouldn't cause any trouble okay so one example one application of comparators was discussed its advantages were discussed some of its limitations and their solutions were discussed one final application of comparators uh, uh, will be discussed in this lecture that uh, i would like to tell you is the generation of pulse width modulation or any modulated signal using comparators and uh, we are going to discuss specifically the sine pulse width modulation and what is the requirement for that so here are two waveforms uh, that are shown on your screens one is a scare wave and one is a little bit modified scare wave and if we see the frequency spectrum of the scare wave and the modified scare wave we can see that there is a considerable number uh, a considerable amount of harmonics considerable magnitudes of harmonics first third and fifth hard harmonics present in the frequency spectrum of these waveforms because a scare wave has multiple frequencies but as we discussed just earlier that these harmonics or these transients are not good for our electrical appliances so if we want to drive an ac appliance what we want what we ideally want is a single frequency ideal sine wave and that will have zero harmonics because that is that contains just one frequency now to digitally generate an ideal sine wave is very very difficult because uh, we cannot generate uh, continuous signals from that so we have to have some harmonics in our sine waves uh, that are generated digitally but how to reduce them to reduce them we use a technique called pulse width modulation and specifically for the sine wave it is called sine pulse width modulation 
we have extensively discussed pulse width modulation in our previous course but what is a sine pulse width modulation let's see here if you if you notice here that this is a pulse width modulated waveform with varying or modulating uh, modulated uh, on and off times and these on and off times these pulse widths are modulated according to the magnitude or amplitude of the sine wave if we see here this is the maximum magnitude of the sine wave and here we can see that this is the maximum time period and here we can see that it is the minimum amplitude of the sine wave and here the uh, the, the, the time period or the pulse width is minimum and if we see here that if we see the harmonics of this particular waveform and filter it to get our, our reconstructed sine wave the sine wave will look like the one presented in this figure it is very close to the actual sine wave and the magnitude of harmonics is much much smaller as compared to the square waves so better for our appliances even better is a three level spwm this was a two level spwm this was a three level spwm where uh, the the sine wave is compared to the triangular wave and a pulse width modulation waveform of these three levels this is one level this is second level and this is the third level a, a waveform like this is generated and let's see its reconstructed sine wave so this is the reconstructed sine wave from the uh, uh, the the three level spwm and you can see that it is almost close to ideal uh, i i have forgotten to include the uh, harmonics the frequency spectrum of this waveform but let me tell you that it uh, it has these red harmonics like this so if if i compare them side to side it it is reduced like this so those harmonics are exponentially reduced if you use a three level pwm and why i am discussing it in the in this topic well a three level or a two level sine pulse width modulated waveform can be easily generated using comparators how let's find out there is a triangular wave coming at one end of the comparator and a sine wave reference sine wave according to which we want to modulate our digital uh, spwm is coming at the second input of the comparator and you can see here in this figure that whenever this blue line or this sine wave is lower in magnitude than this red or triangular wave your output is zero and whenever this is higher than the triangular wave your output is one so it is a very very simple and very very effective way to generate any sort of pwms if you have a reference wave just compare it with a triangular wave and this triangular wave is a high frequency waveform so this will define the base frequency and the reference wave will define the modulation free frequency and you can just like that you can get a very accurate spwm otherwise uh, if you remember maybe we generated an spwm in our uh, microprocessor systems course and we had to calculate each and every uh, uh, value of this this uh, rise time and fall uh, this uh, on time and off time the duty cycle for each uh, separate uh, uh, separate data and we had to generate it manually so this is a very uh, effective way in cases in those cases when you have a reference sine wave at the input if you don't have a reference sine wave at the input this method cannot work if you do have a reference sine wave at the input you can simply use a comparator and use it to generate your spwm so this was one of the very uh, uh, interesting applications of your comparator circuits there are further applications you can explore them uh, on the given links so that's it 
for uh, today's lecture our basics of digital signal conditioning uh, conditioning circuits are uh, uh, somehow covered and in the next lecture we will discuss some more uh, uh, complicated devices like uh, adcs and uh, dscs the analog to digital and digital to analog converters and we'll see how they work and what are the parameters that we have to consider while using them so take good care of yourself till next lecture stay safe allah hafiz